as everyone is filing in, I just want to welcome you to our annual public health career panel. My name is Elisa Crossman, and I'm an undergraduate advisor in the Herbert Wertheim School of Public Health. Tonight's event will consist of three parts. The first is a short presentation. The second will include perspectives from each of our seven panelists. And the third will be a Q&A session with attendees. You can find the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window. For more information about graduate school and careers, please visit the Planning Your Future tab at ph.ucsd.edu backslash undergrad. I want to remind you that today's event will be recorded, will be available on the public health website following the event. Now I'd like to welcome Nadia May, free health advisor in the UC San Diego Career Center, briefly talk about resources at the Career Center and public health careers. Thank you so much, Elisa. Let me just go ahead and share my screen here. All right, perfect. So today I'm going to just briefly talk to you about all the resources that are available in the Career Center and also some considerations as you think post-grad what you want to do, whether you want to pursue public health or even another career in healthcare or something else. So the resources in the Career Center are very vast and wide, so I want to go over a few key things. We can help you with professional and graduate school exploration, whether you know you want to do an MBA or an MPH, or you're even considering medical school, nursing, dentistry, anything like that. We can help you with planning your course prereqs, your tests, your extracurricular activities. We also have resources for career job and internship searches. Um, same thing, if you're a freshman or you're graduating and you want help with, you know, proofreading your resume or cover letter, we can help you with that. We also do mock interviewing as well, whether you have an interview scheduled for a graduate school or a job, we can do mock interviewing with you and kind of give you feedback in real time. And then we also have quite a few events. Everything's virtual now, as you know, but we have uh, career fairs, workshops, information sessions, industry panels, and networking. And we offer these uh, year round. So this is our brand new health professions guide it just came out a few months ago. Uh, we're really proud of it, worked really hard. Um, it covers 10 different health professions, including public health, nursing, physical therapy, dentistry, and so on. And Okay, so it looks like Nadia froze. We will give her a second to come on back. Um, let's see here. Oops, there she is. Nadia? Nadia, you're muted still. Uh, did I leave off where handshake was? Okay, I'll, I'll start from there. Okay, so um, Handshake's a really great resource. You can look up jobs in there, internships, career resources. It's also a great way to schedule an appointment, um, whether you want to do a mock interview or just, you know, go over your resume or talk about career exploration in general. We also have Real Portal, um, and that's another um, amazing resource for looking for research, jobs, and internships. And if you're looking to just connect with alumni, network, you know, find out more about what they're doing. We have the UC San Diego LinkedIn alumni group. Uh, and we also have Triton's Connect, which is a brand new platform. Triton's Connect is very similar to LinkedIn, but it's only for UCSD staff, faculty, and students. And they have a new mentoring tab on there. So you can link your LinkedIn profile to that and also find a mentor who's an alumni, maybe in an industry you're interested in or working for a company you want to learn more about. So as you're kind of going through your career journey and assessing what you want to do next, you want to think about, do you want to further your education or training and how does that look? And if you want to continue, um, you know, your education in public health, is there a particular area you're interested in? I mean, public health has probably at least 10 different areas, if not more, community health, epidemiology, nutrition, you know, environmental health. So kind of thinking about, do you want to target a specific area or do you just want to work in an area like you want to be an advocate or do healthcare education, things like that. Um, also assessing what other experiences do you need to be, get that's going to help you be a competitive applicant. Um, do you need to get more research experience, community service, clinical? 
Um, and there's a lot of great programs abroad too, whether you do an internship or fellowship. So you wanna think about, do you wanna stay here? Do you wanna go abroad for a year or two, get some additional experience, especially if you wanna do global health and really look at things like that. Um, and also looking at the time of commitment for the program, whether it's a couple months or one to two years, and then really thinking about how will this fit your long-term career goals in terms of what you're gonna do next. So other options to consider is after you graduate, do you wanna get work experience or do you wanna do like a gap year, like a fellowship or an internship? So Peace Corps, you know, Teach for America, City Year, those are all really good ways to get additional experience. Project Horseshoe Form is really community health-based. You get education, you work with underserved communities. So a lot of students will do that fellowship if they wanna go into healthcare, such as med school or nursing. Scribe America is also a good way. And then if you really wanna have a more research based career, maybe you wanna do a PhD or an MD PhD or something with a combination of MPH, you can look at doing like the National Institute of Health NIH post -bac program. In addition, there's many other options too. You can look at getting a certification um, and it really depends on sometimes your degree and your level of work, what certification you can get. But there's CHES, CPH, uh, Federal Emergency Management, FEMA actually has over 200 training courses right now, and a lot of them are free. So that's a great way to kind of, you know, enhance your credentials. UCSD Extension is another really good, um, you know, resource to either get a certificate or to take some classes. They have about 20 programs right now, clinical trials, you know, Spanish for healthcare, nutrition, healthcare informatics. So that could be another way to enhance your resume and your experience. Um, other ways would be to look at doing an MPH or maybe a master's in healthcare administration um, e or even getting a more advanced degree such as a doctorate or a PhD. So these are the resources, our key ones in the Career Center for Pre-Health. So our website is healthbeat.ucsd.edu. And I think I mentioned earlier, we have over 10 different health professions as well as key resources to help you plan, prepare and apply to the programs of your choice. We have our Facebook page and Instagram, which are very active. We post opportunities for research, clinical, volunteering, scholarships, things like that. And in the Career Center, you can access virtual advising Monday through Friday from 10 to 3. Um, and you can also make appointments via Handshake. If you have questions about anything, feel free to reach out to us at healthbeat.ucsd.edu too. Thank you so much. I'll pass it back to Elisa. Thank you so much, Nadia. Um, right. Well, I wanted to take this time to introduce our panelists. Uh, panelists, um, if you can please tell us a little bit about yourself, um, your name, your current profession, and your schooling. Let's start with Harji. Hi, everyone. My name is Harji Chiria. Um, I currently work as a technology strategist at Keck Medicine of USC. Um, and I'm also an independent consultant um, at Children's Hospital of Los Angeles in their community affairs department. Um, I graduated from UCSD in 2016 uh, with a major in public health and a minor in business. And I went on to earn my MHA from USC in 2018. Thought I unmuted myself. Thank you. How about Jessica? Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Jessica Diab. I'm a physical therapist. Um, I went to UCSD as well, and I graduated in 2016 um, with my bachelor's in public health and a minor in bio. I then took a gap year, worked a little bit, applied to grad school, and then um, I went to West Coast University for my doctorate in physical therapy. Thank you. Stephanie? Hi, everyone. My name is Stephanie Escobar. Um, I am currently employed with the County of San Diego. I'm a community health promotion specialist. And over this past year, I've been actively supporting the COVID education and outreach efforts. Um, we are supporting all uh, sectors in the community, but I've actively been supporting the business sector. Um, I don't know if anyone in the audience has been participating in the use business outreach program. That's been a great partnership. Um, and I got my bachelor's degree in human development from UCSD. I actually was with Elisa in a year, and I got my master's in public health from San Diego State. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. How about Salem? 
Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. My name is Salem Hawatme. I uh, went to UCSD, I uh, graduated in 2014 with my uh, bachelor's in human biology. And then I went to USC for my master's in health administration, similar to Harji. Um, since then, I've worked in different parts of healthcare. Most recently, I've been working with a company called ECG Management Consultants as a senior consultant, which means I'm working with health systems throughout the country to improve their operations or um, any kind of needs that they have. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Ross? Hi, everyone. My name is Araz. Uh, I currently work at UCSD in Dr. Fielding Miller's lab, and um, we're doing a pilot study called Safer at School Early Alert um, Program. And what we're doing is we are doing wastewater and surface sampling at elementary schools and um, preschools and daycares to find COVID early on so we can prevent outbreaks. Um, I graduated from UCSD with my bachelor's in public health uh, 2019, so right before the pandemic. So that's been really interesting. Thank you, Megan. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Megan and I graduated from SDSU with my bachelor's in public health and a minor in biology as well. And then I did my master's um, in global health in um, at University of Washington and where I focused on infectious disease prevention from a community led standpoint. Um, I currently serve as a lead supervisor for the UCSD's COVID response team here and I own and operate a women's health clinic in Malawi, Africa where we focus on cervical cancer prevention. Awesome, thank you. And last but not least, Nicole. Hi, my name is Nicole Nazari and I graduated in 2015 from UCSD with a major in public health. Uh, I currently am in my last year of law school actually at California Western. And while I don't have a career, I was told it was not a disqualification from participating in the career panel, but I do have hopes in pursuing like healthcare law or food law. So hopefully a lot to contribute um, to those interested in those fields. Excellent, thank you all so much. Now we're going to get into some of the questions that we have. And as a reminder, students, um, if you do have questions, please do feel free um, to hold on to those until we're, um, we've gotten through the, the rest of our questions, but then you'll be using the Q&A um, in the bottom of your screen. So, um, Nicole, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, your, I know you, you said you don't really have a career yet, but did you have a path in mind um, from the beginning? Um, how did your path sort of change? Tell us a little bit about your trajectory for, for your career choices. Um, well, I would like to say my career trajectory has been like a roller coaster, not like the cute little ones, but like a Six Flags roller coaster, lots of twists and turns, definitely not the traditional path. And part of it's because I, I came to UCSD just influenced by like culture and family to go to med school. And I just knew that wasn't the path for me. And I got educated with my education and I learned of other factors influencing health and hence switching my major to public health. And I really became more interested in more of the environmental racism side and more of the impact of race on health, hence influencing my decision to go to law school. Um, so I'm extremely happy I made that decision uh, just to be a legal advocate and address more of the policy issues concerning health. So I definitely wouldn't say um, it was a linear path for me, but with those twists and turns, I've kind of ended up in the place I think I was meant to be. And, um, you know, I'm still trying to figure out what my established career would be. But again, with the legal profession I've learned in law school, you have so many opportunities that uh, once I pass the bar and I become officially a lawyer, I think that I'll have plenty of options. Awesome, and I know I had talked to a couple of students um, earlier this quarter about something very similar. So I hope watching. Uh, Megan, can you share with us a little bit about your, your career trajectory and sort of what the twists and turns might've been, how it might've changed? Absolutely. So I am what you would call an unconventional student or non-traditional. I went back to school when I was 26 and it was kind of scary. I'm the first person in my family to make it past eighth grade. So I really didn't know how to navigate 
graduate or undergraduate school in any way, shape or form. So I really, really clung on to mentorship and finding the correct mentorship path for me. Um, I started out working in a research lab um, and found out quickly that it wasn't for me, but it was such a great learning experience about how, where I fit in the world of both science and research and public health. And from that, I found um, what I do now. I took opportunities during my undergraduate to conduct research both domestically and abroad. And I really found there that I love diving in and um, doing field work. And so I, that's how I started my clinic, actually. I found myself in Malawi and used what I had kind of built um, during my undergraduate to glean that into my graduate program and find my research there. So it definitely has not been a linear path, just like Nicole said, but um, I think the messier it is sometimes, the more you find exactly where you're supposed to be. I have experience in that myself. And I think that that's something that a lot of our students get really nervous about. So I appreciate both of your perspectives on that. Um, Aras, I know that you're just starting out. Um, do you wanna kind of tell us a little bit about what your sort of experience was figuring out where you want to be eventually? Uh, yeah, I'd say pretty similar to Nicole. I started off um, thinking I'm gonna go to med school and be a doctor, which means you have your literal whole life figured out. And then I went from that to deciding that it's not for me. And so it was stressful trying to figure out what am I gonna change my major to? What am I gonna do with my life? But um, once I switched to public health, I can confidently say I fell in love with all of my classes at UCSD, which meant that um, my next step was just to figure out what, which like area of public health I want to pursue a career in. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at. I decided to take a few gap years to work within different fields just to get some experience and narrow down um, what I wanna do for grad school. Um, and so now I'm at the stage where I've decided on Epi and um, hopefully I'll start grad school in the fall. Well, that's exciting. Um, yeah, I think that a lot of times we are so focused on what the next thing is that we don't take the time to think about it. And so I love that you took a few years to think about what you were going to do. And I think that a lot of our students could benefit from that. Thank you. Um, Salem, can you tell us about your career trajectory and your path, uh, maybe some changes along those, that path? Yeah, thanks for asking. I um, was doing a human bio uh, degree at UCSD and I started um, doing some research and I started actually volunteered at Thornton Hospital. And so from there, I was like, all right, I'm gonna be a doctor. And I think that's a lot of what people think, right? And then they realize that, that healthcare um, is much more expansive than just delivering medical care. And so once I opened up my, um, my perspective and saw what I, I was good at, and that is more the operational business administrative side of healthcare that opened up a whole new world um, of, of opportunities. And that's when I pursued my MHA at USC. And there I was able to kind of pick at different parts of healthcare from startup space to consulting space to the provider space. And in all those got to see what I love and then started aiming then, I mean, after years of doing that, then I was like, okay, I know exactly what I need and what skills I can bring to the type of company. And that doesn't mean it has to be a big company or a small company or whatever the size is. It just means that it has to fit what I'm looking for based on what I've learned from all these internships or all these experiences. So that's me. Yeah, I mean, I love what you said about it. You fitting the company in with your experiences. I think that that's a really important part that a lot of us also don't think about you know when we're when we're just starting out a lot of it is how can I fit in um, but you also need to fit the company in thank you um, Stephanie um, can you describe your career trajectory um, and your twists and turns Yes, happy to. So uh, when I went to UCSD, I wasn't a public health major. And actually, like many of you, I was pre-med. I am a first-generation college graduate. So med school was, you know, a really big ambition. And um, I found out late in my undergrad experience that physics just wasn't a subject for me. So I knew that med school dream uh, 
would not be fulfilled. And so I started exploring other areas. Um, unlike a lot of students who changed their majors, I actually kept my human development major when I was an undergrad. Um, it was very interdisciplinary. But after uh, obtaining my bachelor's degree, that's when I had a couple of uh, career changes. I started actually in student affairs and then um, during the course of my career there, I realized I really wanted to do something in the healthcare field. And so I actually um, left the education sector to go to public health and um, I started working for a nonprofit. Um, and so, yeah, my first some interns in my career, I got my um, master's degree at San Diego State while working for Planned Parenthood. That was a really wonderful experience work for profit. And since then, I've worked for a nonprofit uh, hospital organization and the county. Um, and it's always been a learning lesson. Great, uh, you know, experiences have taught me a lot over the years. So um, hope it helps. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, Jessica, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your career trajectory and your path? Yeah, definitely. Um, going into UCSD, I kind of always knew I wanted to become a physical therapist, um, knew since high school. Um, it was just more of which major I was most interested in. I first started out with physiology and neuroscience. Um, I really liked the physio aspect, but the neuroscience was a little bit more difficult. And then I had a friend in um, also doing public health. Um, so I said, let's check it out. And so I started diving into a little bit more. I was like, this is amazing, really applicable to PT as well. Um, and so I did that and then um, finished up there. I took a gap year after undergrad to kind of just work on working, taking the GRE, um, building up my portfolio to apply to grad school. Um, and then I went to grad school for three years, did my clinical rotations, all of that. Especially during COVID, that was tough. <laughs> and then, yeah, I finished up last year, took my boards, passed, and now full time PT. So it was kind of a rocky start after the gap year and during grad school because of COVID, having to change all the plans all around, kind of having to do or staying at home work style and learning besides being in the clinic. So that was difficult. Um, but yeah, that was my trajectory. So it sounds like um, of our seven panelists, uh, we have, you know, just hardly left, but it sounds like you're the first one that actually knew from the beginning um, and stuck with uh, what you were going to do. And I think, you know, from my perspective, I see so many students that are so stressed out that, you know, I just don't know exactly what I want to do. So it really helps me as an advisor to hear everybody's stories. It makes me really happy to hear that there's so many successful um, people working in public health um, who didn't really know exactly what they were going to do, but it also helps to know that if you if you do know what you want to do, you can still be successful with that too. So thank you. Um, Harji? Yeah, I'll add another story about not knowing. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so I had a general idea I wanted to be in health and education, but that was about it. I think every significant step I took, uh, my interests evolved and I got more information as I went through the position. And so uh, I was constantly reevaluating my plan. You know, I went into the MHA program thinking operations was great for me. I came out thinking strategy was another great option. I did a fellowship and developed an interest in technology. Then I went to a health tech startup, got laid off. You know, it was just a it's just a roller coaster, up and down, up and down. Um, and then my current role, uh, I'm really enjoying the work. I've kind of honed in on my interests, but I'm still learning and I'm still developing um, what my next step might be. Awesome, thank you. Um, so. I wanted to start um, asking our panelists, um, why can you tell me what your typical day looks like? Maybe Stephanie, can we start with you? Hi everyone. So as I mentioned earlier, um, over the past year, I have been actively supporting uh, our COVID response education and outreach for the business sector. So um, it varies day to day. Um, as many of you know, uh, information is very fluid. It's been changing. Um, there's a lot of adapting that goes on. Um, so uh, my work, we're really trying to work with the community to inform them, uh, help pivot, because we know it's huge, um, and prepare. Um, I'm specifically working towards businesses, so, you know, helping um, 
um, employers, their employees. Um, it's just a lot of to be on it, and we're adapting as we go. So uh, it's cool. I've uh, learned, you know, some new skills over the past year, and I've actually been able to uh, hone in on, you know, the skills that I really enjoy: uh, relationship building, communication, um, and you know, for me, I I'm very passionate about. Uh, about health motion. So to see um, right now, the county is utilizing promotoras or community health workers to really help with the equity piece for vaccine. And that is just wonderful. Something I learned in grad school to see that now it's in the main media and other people in the community are learning about that is, is wonderful. Awesome, thank you. Now, Raz, I know that you're also working with COVID. Can you tell us a little bit about your typical day? Yeah, sure. Um, I actually started um, working as a contact tracer for UCSD and I did that for a few months. Um, I mean, the pandemic is horrible, but as a public health person, it was pretty interesting to graduate and then experience um, a pandemic and just the community need for public health. But um, right now with the current project that I work on, I'm the lead data manager. So um, my day consists of a lot of Excel spreadsheets and a lot of looking at data and um, just um, figuring out the logistics of things. Um, and then I also do qualitative research. So um, right now we've done quite a few um, focus groups and in-depth interviews with parents and staff at the schools we work at. So we're um, analyzing our qualitative data. So a lot of coding. Thank you. Megan, how about your, your day? Yeah, so normally I, from like six to eight, I touch base with my Malawi team. We are nine hours apart, so we have kind of odd schedules. So I touch base with them to see about our daily clinical operations and see what they need there. And um, then I jump into my epi role here at UCSD, where I kind of serve as the bridge to our director of public health and our advisory board and our contact tracers, our outbreak investigation team and our um case investigation team, all three of them. And so I just kind of make sure that they're thriving and see what they need because Araz, as you might be able to say, it's, it's an intense job and they are constantly dealing with the various problems that COVID presents. Um, and so I just make sure that they're doing well and then to the best of my ability and kind of being the best problem solver I can be. Thank you. Salem, can you tell us a little bit about your typical day? Yes, thank you um, for asking. So. A typical day, I'm a, I'm a consultant uh, by trade now, and so a typical day is very different and it really depends on the needs of the client. But um, if I were to sum it in different buckets of what I end up doing on a regular day, um, I think it would include a lot of the things that you might be used to, like meetings, preparing for meetings and having conversations. But three main buckets in my head are analyzing information, whether it's database, so Excel, or whether it's more qualitative information that you're putting together. The second thing is putting together the story of what you're trying to solve and how you're going to solve it, whether that's through presentations or any kind of uh, document that you're creating. And number three is taking the time to think through problem solving. So I think a lot of times we spend time doing things, but what um, I enjoy about my position is I have to sit down and actually figure out different solutions, present them to my leaders, and actually get buy-in from the leaders and the clients before we can actually implement solutions. So um, I spend a lot of time doing those three buckets almost every day. Thank you. Jessica, can you tell us a little bit about your typical day? Yeah, I currently work in a outpatient clinic and I also work part-time um, on the weekends here and there at a skilled nursing facility. Um, I see patients of all ages from starting at five years old to 102 years old. Um, and I see a variety of cases from low back pain, um, shoulder injuries, um, all sorts of things post-stroke. I've been actually seeing a lot of um, post-COVID patients with respiratory um, dysfunction. So having trouble breathing, um, getting them back to their daily functions, being able to improve their cardiovascular endurance, getting back to movement. Um, and also I've been seeing a lot of different types of patients in regards of chronic pain to um, high-end athletes. So it's really exciting. Um, and it's really being comfortable with working with any type of population. Um, so it really just depends. I have been working um, with post 
uh, with COVID patients as well at the skilled nursing facility. Um, so that's been a whole experience in itself, but we're taking all the right precautions, um, gowning up, I'm fully vaccinated, which is ex happy for. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of my daily schedule, um, usually in the clinic. And then sometimes I also do home health. Um, so we're, because of I'm doing um, seeing patients in the skilled nursing facility, I'm not doing home health. Um, but once COVID kind of settles down, I will be going back to that as well. Yeah. So it's a lot of patient work. All right, thank you. Um, Harji, could you tell us a little bit about your typical day? Uh, sure. Um, so it's pretty varied. Um, but uh, so I might be conducting market research on, you know, potential products we want to implement. Uh, you know, we might be analyzing data sets in Excel, uh, perhaps under trying to understand what our operational and our capital budgets might be for our next year. Um, you know, contributing to potential, you know, strategy development committees with physicians or operational leadership, or um, even conducting internal interviews to understand what our current state is and, you know, uh, where our areas of improvement are. Awesome. Thank you so much. Nicole, I know that you're still in school, but can you tell us a little bit about um, what typical days have looked like when you've maybe worked, um, you know, with the judges or, you know, on cases or things like that? Yes, definitely. So um, I actually created my schedule uh, so that this is this semester, my last semester, I'm only externing and I'm externing for a judge um, in the district court um, of San Diego. And you would think I wouldn't do with science, but I am. I'm actually working on a securities case um, involving a pharma company. So I get to read through clinical trials and um, I'm like super excited about it because I get to kind of marry my interests of like the law and, and public health related medical sciences. So, but that'll be at least eight hours a day. And that would just be what my typical day looks like right now. That sounds very overwhelming, but also kind of fun. <laughs> So um, I know um, that you aren't that far away from being an undergraduate, um, Nicole. Um, do you do you wish you had done anything differently as an undergraduate to better prepare yourself for your profession? Um, or did you do anything that you felt was really helpful? Yeah, I talked to my sisters about this a lot where there's so many things that I wish I did differently when I was at UCSD. And one of them would be to network and to really utilize the resources that the school provides. And I think Megan pointed to this also earlier, but you know how she found a mentor and finding a mentor to perhaps kind of guide you through the process where you assume or you think that you wanna, you know, reach a certain career goal, but you're not really sure about it. And so just having someone to talk to and bounce ideas off of. And I think just in general with, uh, and I know Roz mentioned this, but it wasn't until public health where I really loved the class I was taking and I was super engaged. But if I could just tell my old self to treat every class, um, not, just to, not just to learn for the grade, but to really learn as if I'm gonna be utilizing the information in my future career, I think I could have taken even more away from my education. So just a combination of being really present and networking and finding a mentor. Um, to kind of have a better picture of where you're gonna be going. Awesome, thank you. Um, Aras, maybe you want to pick up on a little bit of what Nicole was saying, because she just, she mentioned you. Um, if you can tell us um, what you wish you'd done differently as an undergrad um, or what you did that was really helpful, that would be awesome. Yeah, I have the same answers. I think um, I wish I had reached out to professors sooner than I did. I didn't really do that until my, I was a transfer. So I only had two years at UCSD and I didn't really like talk to my professors one-on-one -on -one until my uh, last year. And I feel like it was kind of too late. So I would say definitely reach out to your professors, not only because you find their class interesting, but just to learn about their path, because I think like I don't know, I don't want to throw out a statistic, but most people in public health didn't just decide that they're going to do public health right off the bat. Um, and they just kind of like went this, you know, like roller coaster path on, until they reached where they're at. So 
just talk to professors, ask them about their experiences and what their story is and how um, they got to where they are today, just to give you an idea of all the different opportunities that you can have. And also just to, I think networking is key in getting, you know, internships and jobs. Um, and one thing I did that I would highly recommend is the honors practicum. Um, that's land, that's every skill that I used and learned in the honors practicum I have used during my jobs. Um, and I feel like it was just a really good um, experience that almost feels like a, a job while you're a student. Thank you. And I know sometimes we forget that faculty are really good resources. So that's excellent advice. Thank you. Um, Harji, could you tell us a little bit about um, what you did as an undergraduate and how it prepared you or didn't prepare you um, for what you're doing now um, and what you might have done that was very helpful? Yeah, so um, I think, so I only looked for internships starting my junior year. I wish I had done that earlier. Um, so I had more real world experience to base my decisions off of, you know, before I entered my MHA program. Um, had I done that, I probably would have developed, you know, strong business skills with Excel and PowerPoint that are particularly helpful in entry level roles um, earlier. Uh, and then something I did in grad school, but I wish I had done in undergrad was just setting up informational interviews with people I admired. You know, now I do some LinkedIn stalking. I set up, you know, send them a message and um, and then I'll just have a conversation with them about how they got to where they are. Um, and sometimes, you know, those mentorship roles uh, and opportunities uh, come from those conversations. Absolutely. Um, Jessica, could you tell us a little bit about um, what you'd done differently, what you would have done differently as an undergrad or what you did that was really helpful? Um, I'll first start with what I thought was really helpful. Um, I definitely joined a lot of organizations right off the bat. Um, I definitely joined the ones that I saw applicable to my career, um, but also outside of that, such as um, I did do the physical therapy club there, um, as well as joining other different associations. Um, I'm not sure if Flying um, Samaritans is still there, but a lot of other orgs that did volunteer work around San Diego. Um, so I really recommend that to people that are interested in kind of helping out the community and learning from those resources that are very beneficial and how to expand from there as well. Um, some things I wish I did differently, um, similar to um, what others was saying, kind of, I wish I reached out more and kind of reached out to have a mentor specifically. Um, there was definitely a couple of professors I was comfortable with like approaching, but um, I wish I was doing that a little bit more. So don't be afraid to get out there and, you know, um, ask the questions that you know um, that you want to ask and get answered or even if you don't know what to ask just get step into someone's office be like hey I just want to introduce myself I'm taking your class like um, just showing your face is just a step one um, and so then during class the professor will recognize that and you can start building a relationship and feeling comfortable asking them maybe about questions about the lecture questions about their research specifically or resources in the community that will help your career choices or just kind of getting your foot in the door so just take that step forward and that doesn't necessarily mean professors but maybe joining other organizations on campus or um, anything of that nature to kind of just get your foot out the door get out and move as well so, yeah love how everybody has their own unique take on this, but we've got so much wonderful experience here. So thank you, everybody. Um, Stephanie, do you want to, would you like be a, would you like to add any information about what you would have done as an undergrad or what you did that was really helpful? Uh, yeah. Um, so as I mentioned, I was pre-med for most of my undergrad. So I had a lot of pre-med that I was appropriate, right? So I volunteered at the UCSD Medical Center in Hillcrest. I did a pre-medical program at UCLA. 
Uh, and I was part of, you know, the Chicano Latinos Creative Medicine Club. Uh, I did some research about engineering lab. Uh, if I could go back, though, I would probably try to do some more profit volunteering. As I mentioned, I work, I did career change and I went to work for Planned Parenthood, which is wonderful but it was also a learning lesson, right? Nonprofits don't pay a lot of money. So that was one thing I wish I would have done as an undergrad. I was just really kind of focused on med school and um, not so much open to bigger things. But uh, one thing I will share, and I didn't see the beauty of it until years later, as an undergrad, I worked for 1-800-NO-BUT, the California Smoker Helpline. So that was really my first exposure to public health. I didn't realize it at the time it was program evaluation. So it wasn't very in, uh, interesting for me. But um, years later, I realized, wow, that was my first experience. And that uh, taught me a lot about behavioral change. And so that was, um, you know, something I was able to take with me to graduate school because my concentration in my MPH is health and behavioral science. So I would just, you know, really encourage students um, kind of be open to any type of opportunity, whether it be unpaid volunteering or something paid. But um, I, I have the mindset that any experience is really a good learning opportunity and you really never know when you'll need information uh, in your career. Awesome, thank you. Um, Salem, would you be willing to share? Of course. Um... I see this in two parts, and uh, these uh, touch on a lot of what we've been hearing right now. The first part is while I'm in the program, I think while you're in your classes and you're going through your assignments, a lot of times we're thinking about the grade. We are, uh, UCSD is a competitive institution, so you're always thinking about how can I do the best job possible. But what I would love for you to do is if you listen to your gut, we talk about listening to our gut when we are working with other people or we're meeting new people. But what about when you're going to class and doing assignments? You will feel either excited or dreading whatever assignment it is. Forget about tests. I don't think anyone likes tests. But if you're doing an assignment that has to do with a presentation that you're excited about, that's how I knew in my classes that this is what I want to keep doing. This is the kind of work I want to keep doing. And this is what my career will look like. So that's one thing that I think you could do now right away. Um, in terms of long term, I really think that you as I learned the hard way, need to network as much as possible. And I do not like the term networking. Networking assumes putting on this idea of selling yourself and, and proving that you're worthy to, to talk to and, and that you should talk to some. I, I, I stopped seeing it that way and it really helped me by just making new friends. And those friends could be alum of the, of, of the university. They could be friends or family. It could be people on LinkedIn. Um, and those new friends that you just haven't met yet are people who can just open up your eyes or even have an internship that you don't know about yet. Or you can even create your own door that doesn't even exist yet, um, especially in public health or healthcare. Those doors are always needing to be open, whether it's paid or free. Um, there's always ways to, to offer help and to, to gain um, information and, and guidance. So I think not being afraid of rejection and just putting yourself out there is, is, is the way to go. That's, I think, the best description I've ever heard of networking, um, and it makes it a lot less scary. Thank you. Megan, would you uh, be willing to share with us? Yeah, absolutely. Salem, I really appreciated that advice because it's something that I share with students often, that professors are people that you're going to reach out with. It can be intimidating, and you just have to remember that they're human, and they're just at different points in their career than you, and they're there to help you, and I fully agree with the networking can kind of be cringy, so try and create meaningful mentorship, and they know you're going to reach out. It's, it's part of what their job is to do it, so just don't be intimidated by it, and don't take it personal if you don't hear back right away. I never realized until I got to this point in my career how many emails people really do get, <laughs> so they'll get to it and they'll read it. Um, but something that really helped in my undergraduate specifically was just seeking out every opportunity that I thought that would make to provide, um, to provide me with the skills to help me propel into my career and be attainable as an employee uh, that would help my future team to the best of my ability. And the more opportunities that you have to hone your path, you'll it'll help to find, again, where you fit in, in the world of public health. Um, but the most important for me is that sometimes I could get so short-sighted on from my A to B path that I would kind of miss those peripheral points of um, information that are there or opportunities that might've been arising when those could have been the path for me. So I guess taking those times for other opportunities that you might not think are going to be your path, but they might be so. Yeah. 
super helpful. Thank you. Thank you all to our panelists. Um, I think we have time for one more question before we get into the Q and A. Um, so I guess I'll start with you, Megan, since you're you're still on my screen. Um, what advice can you give to students who are struggling to decide about their future career plans? That's a big question. <laughs> I'm halfway through my career and I'm still making plans about my career. So it's, again, it's evolving. And I will say, and this sounds absolutely terrifying, but your undergraduate is not the everything. My undergraduate has nothing to do with my current career path. So I would say, take it one day at a time, continuing to look for those opportunities and you'll, you'll find your path. Thank you. Um, Nicole, how about you? Yeah, echoing Megan, I'm still in, well, I don't even have a career yet, so I'm not in the midst of it, but um, it is ever evolving. But really, if I could, I'm just telling my old self this, but just take a pause, take the time, reflect. It's okay if, you know, you don't reach the next academic step for a year, two years, however long it is, because in that time, you will have a better understanding of exactly what you want to do. Um, I mean, the more you learn, the more you understand what you're really passionate about and what you're really good at. And so if I had just told myself, like, it's okay if I don't do anything, I'll figure it out. Um, I maybe would have ended up in the same spot I am right now, but it might've happened sooner. So just, uh, just take your time. I love that. Archie. Um, so this works for me, it may work for y'all. I wrote down a list of criteria for a fulfilling career. And I wrote down a list of criteria for fulfilling life. And then I tried to find a job or a path that met at that intersection. Um, I am a super logical, analytical person. So this is what worked for me. Um, but on top of that, um, just building on what Salem said, I think using your gut um, is a great way to figure out what feels right and what feels wrong. Um, and then following that instinct um, as you move through each role and position that you take on. I love that. I've actually never heard somebody say that they that they made that many lists, but I, I love that. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Jessica. I would say um, that's a hard question, but I would say get out there and try different things. Um, try doing research and seeing what kind of opportunities are available. Um, for example, I did shadow a pediatrician back in the day before I was like, I wanted, I decided on PT. I realized it wasn't me after spending a whole summer there. Um, so don't be afraid to spend some time trying something. And it's okay if you don't like it. At least you know, hey, this wasn't for me. I'm going to try something new. Um, and then also kind of just doing your research. Uh, if you're interested, for example, in pediatrics, what kind of things can I do with pediatrics and um, do with public health? Let me talk to a professor about it. Um, there's so many different career options. Um, but don't be afraid that's like, I'm settling for this and this is the only thing out there. Not necessarily, there's so much room to go out and do different things. Um, I myself, I'm still trying to figure out, do I want to work just with adults or do I want to focus primarily on pediatrics? So don't be afraid there's time for change and the world's your oyster. Thank you. For us. Just echoing everyone else, just take it one step at a time. You don't have to know where you'll be in 10 years. Um, you just need to figure out your next step. So sometimes it can be easier to figure out what you don't like, and that's okay too. So for example, my first job after I graduated, I was a coordinator on a um, tobacco control project. So my work was a lot of policy and advocacy, which I thought I would really like, and I ended up not liking it at all. So I narrowed down, you know, what kind of things I don't like, and that was helpful for me. Um, so just don't be afraid to say yes to different opportunities and test the waters. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie. So my advice would be, um, as I had mentioned earlier, really here when I was younger, um, I was felt like I had to have a paid job, right? Well, helpful as an undergrad student. But um, I didn't really take advantage of the opportunities to volunteer throughout my career. Sometimes the best uh, uh, networking and uh, 
door open for a position has been from a volunteer assignment. So really just be open to that. Um, some other advice that I'd shared just that I really took advantage of is study abroad. Um, you know, I focused on like having these requirements in school that I cut it out. Uh, it's not something I took advantage of. I work with a lot of grad students um, on my team and some of the best interviews have been with students who've studied abroad. Just they have a new perspective. They learn a lot from going, you know, to another country and just uh, seeing a different um, you know, uh, unit learning about things. Uh, I'll echo what someone said about informational interviewing. Definitely that is important. Um, so it's okay just to ask questions to get to know what um, professions are out there. Um, and someone else had asked in the chat about, uh, you know, from higher education community, um, just realize that any skills that you learn along the way, they're transferable skills. So, you know, keeping in mind, maybe you use in one position for volunteer, but, you know, later on in your career, you're going to really tap into that in the work that you do. So, um, you know, Thank you. And then Salem, what advice can you give to students? Um, so I have put a lot of thought into this throughout my life. And I always thought to myself, there's so many opportunities that we can get, right? Your path is, it could go anywhere. And so I created this um, method of figuring out how you should narrow that down. And so if we just take a few seconds to think through this with me. Um, if you can put yourself in your future position, whatever that may, may be, because you don't know what that is yet, maybe, um, and, and you wake up that morning, let's say five years into your career, you wake up that morning and you're about to go to work, whether it's at home or at a specific location, what activities do you want to do at your job? The moment you ask yourself the question of what activities, what day-to-day -day items do you want to be doing at your job, it will narrow the list of options for you tremendously. Let me give you an example. Uh, my parents wanted me to be a doctor. That's why I was uh, pursuing that before. And then I started thinking for myself and I started doing more of the business side of healthcare, right? A lot of us are in that position. So when you're thinking of practicing medicine versus administration of medicine, what's the difference? If you're a doctor, you're going into work, you are going to be in the doctor's clothes, the white robe. You're going to be, you know, um, documenting the medical record. You're going to be talking to patients, talking to staff, and you're going to have the patient's lives at your hands a lot of the times. As an administrator, I'm not going, generally speaking, and, 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 and fixing a patient's problem specifically. I'm doing it indirectly through more administrative tasks like Excel, PowerPoint, presentations, all these things. So my activities are very different, but we're both in healthcare, we both work together, and we both have this main goal of helping patients have the best outcomes. And so that thinking about those activities, I think will help you narrow what you might want to do. Thank you. Um, now, I know that we have a lot of students who have a lot of questions, so students, please feel free to use the Q&A um, in, the, in the bottom of your um, Zoom window, um, and we will try and answer as many questions as we can live. I know that there have actually been a couple of questions answered already in the chat, um, but if they if I can, I will try and answer those as well live so that anyone who is listening to the recording can actually um, get the benefit of that. Panelists, as the questions are being read out, just feel free to jump in. Um, I suspect that um, we're probably not gonna be doing too much talking over one another. Um, so I know that the first question that I saw was for Nicole actually. Um, a student was wondering if you had ever thought of also getting your MPH with your JD because the student wants to do health law and has been looking at JD MPH programs, but wonders whether a JD alone is good enough for working in health policy and law. Yeah, so that's a great question. I definitely did consider it, but the more I thought about it, uh, I think the undergraduate degree in public health is sufficient enough to showcase your foundational skills of the area. So the MPH may, may be a resume builder, but it may not add anything, I would say, extraordinary to your application. Plus, if you find the right law school that has a very strong health law concentration, 
that's your ticket in. That's how you're going to um, find professors who, who work in the field, who have connections. And I've really learned that with law school and networking. I know we don't like the term, but it's, it's everything. And even I remember I was on our job posting database a couple of weeks ago, and even UCSD Health had a posting for a contract officer, a contracts officer. And I mean, I'm not a JD yet, so I couldn't apply. But again, choose the right school that has a great program, great professors. And um, I think that'll be sufficient enough. Another student had asked actually about different sectors of public health law. Are there different sectors that they can start researching? Um, I would say public health law is pretty general. And so I don't see there's like a niche area of it that you could perhaps be researching. I really think that with either like the public health or the health law aspect, there is so much that you can do. I even know that, for example, one of our alums who I'm in contact with, she's part of in-house counsel for Eisenhower Health. They're a major hospital in um, Palm Desert. There's just a group of three lawyers and they're, you know, in-house counsel. So um, I would just say keeping it broad for now for your research is fine. But uh, to my first point, just choosing the right school, I think is really going to be everything. You. I know Salem, you had answered this in the chat, um, but I think that this was a great question and I'd like for our students um, who are just watching the recording afterwards um, to have the benefit of actually hearing your answer. Um, a student had asked if you were in their shoes as a senior graduating in the middle of a pandemic, how would you go about finding experience through internships? Thanks. Um, to summarize what I responded with, uh... I would figure out what the gaps in my experience that I'm looking for is. Sometimes it's great to just find any internship that could fit in your field, but a lot of times it's much better to figure out what gaps of knowledge that you need to gain and imagine what you want to end up putting on your resume. So you're more, you're making use of the time. That way, if it's an unpaid internship, that way the transaction is that you're helping them achieve a goal, but you're also learning the tools that you need or the skills that you need. And the question I believe was about doing that during COVID and how do you acquire internships when it's not very um, um, maybe uh, as available. What I would do is I would start by, if you don't have a network already creating a network, uh, the best way that works for me is LinkedIn. I go LinkedIn, find the target organizations that fit what I'm looking for. I find people who may have graduated from UCSD or any other um, organization that you're tied to. And then if someone graduated five years ago from UCSD, I don't see why they wouldn't want to help. And so if you contact 10 people and one responds to you, you just talk to that person, 15 minute chat. And then by the end of the call, you see if they can connect you to more people. Now you have a total of three people. And you just keep going until you perhaps find a good fit with an internship, or at least you have all this informational knowledge to just branch out. And I think that would be my main recommendation. Thank you. Um, and I know that this was also um, answered in the chat a little bit, um, but for anybody who did research experience while they were a student, um, how did you go about uh, approaching professors about research opportunities? I think that that's something that a lot of students have um, a lot of anxiety about. I can answer that. If, oh, there we go. Okay. Should I go? Okay. Um, honestly, I was one of those students who had a lot of anxiety about that. Um, I was a transfer, so my junior year was my first year at UCSD, and I was just figuring out how things worked, um, how to navigate this ginormous university and how to make friends when everyone already has their groups and all of that. So um, in a way I kind of freaked out and I was like, oh my gosh, am I not doing enough? How am I supposed to find like a research in internship? Like how does all of this work? Um, so I found the Marshall Mentor Program and I applied to that and I ended up being matched with um, a professor who happened to have um, qualitative research internship available. And I took that and it just worked out really well. Um, so I would say just try to find different resources. The Career Center is a really good place to start. They can guide you in the right direction. Um, and if you can also just do informational interviews with professors that you find um, that their research interests you. Um, most of them are really, really happy to talk about their research and their experience with you. So 
um, don't be afraid to do that. Thank you. Um, so we had another question in uh, the Q&A uh, from a student who was wondering, uh, for everyone who's working with data, research, and health information, what kinds of hard skills did you find to be the most valuable and how did you hone them? Um, student was ask, asking specifically about Excel, coding, R versus SAS, and being self-taught or taking classes. I can answer that. For my team specifically, we actually use a data analyst who um, has taken courses in all of the above that you mentioned. And we primarily work um, with REDCap and use our data in there. And he is really great at coding. And I know he took courses specifically for that. In my master's, I took um, SPSS and R specifically within Biostats because I knew I was not, that wasn't a strong skill for me. So I wanted the full course load of it, but I'm sure that our, our UCSD actually offers a lot of continuing education, education classes um, on a lot of those. Thank you. Anybody else? I know that there's lots of people who work with some data. That's okay. Um, Harji, I know that there was a question in the chat specifically for you. A student was wondering if you could explain your position at the Children's Hospital and how you got involved with the hospital itself. Um, so, I mentioned earlier that I was laid off uh, when the pandemic hit. And so I found this first job at uh, Keck Medicine of USC uh, in tech strategy. Um, but while I was interviewing, um, there was another role that I interviewed for. Um, and we liked each other, but they said, hey, you know, let's uh, take some time. And, you know, we need to evaluate what's going on with uh, the pandemic before we get back to you. And I was just persistent. And um, eventually in October, uh, they were like, okay, we're ready to move forward with this opportunity. So honestly, it was just luck that I was able to find that independent consulting role. Um, what I'm specifically doing is helping them with their community health needs assessment. Uh, they're going through a refresh this year. Um, and so it almost feels like I'm going back to my public health roots, which is really nice. Um, and I'm getting to work on strategies um, that I already have a strong educational background in. Thank you. I think this is a question that I would love if everybody could answer. Um, I, I got a, a question from a student um, about how you feel your work-life balance is. I think that this is a question that we get a lot from students. Um, the student is asking, does it ever get challenging? And how do you feel that your career path accommodates your personal life and your hobbies? Maybe Harji, would you like to start? Um, yeah, so um, I mentioned having a list of criteria when I was selecting a job and that was one of the big items on that list. Um, I've made it a goal to set boundaries uh, with my work um, and also maintain my hobbies. Um, and that ensures that I'm not burning out, uh, ensures that you know, I'm being as productive as possible during the day. Um, and if I need to uh, pull back on my workload, I talk to my boss about it and um, we have a conversation. And generally uh, I've had the good fortune of working with um, superiors that understand. Um, for the most part, it's, yeah, it's just really important to me that I uh, continue to do things outside of work. Um, I think we're all multifaceted beings and we should have, you know, other parts to our life besides, you know, our work. Absolutely. Thank you. Jessica? Um, I would say for the moment, it's it's been good. Um, I currently want to do more studying, so I know I have to figure out that life balance as well, um, especially life things in general, uh, planning to get married this year and all this stuff. So figuring out, um, working and saving up for that, but not also burning out and working too much. Um, so for myself, I like to set a schedule at the beginning of the week. Um, for example, if I wanna squeeze an exercise, let's do it before work. So waking up a little bit earlier, sleeping earlier um, to do that as well. Um, and figuring out time for me as well. You know, um, Sometimes when we work too much, we forget the quality time for ourselves and so important for our psychosocial well-being. So I try to squeeze that in throughout the week as well, whether that 
is going on a walk or squeezing in my Netflix time, which I appreciate and I love. Um, so it's all about what you put in, put out. But um, I wouldn't say there's still some challenges, definitely trying to squeeze in, hanging out with family and figuring out work on the weekends or this and that. So it's just about sitting down and figuring out your schedule. That's what worked for me at, at least. Um, and kind of letting people know, be like, hey, um, I have this going on, just wanted to let you know. Um, like let, letting the company know as well if things are getting too much or not. So just being honest about things. Thank you. And Stephanie. Hi, so I'm a parent, a working parent. And during COVID, I'll be honest, it's been very challenging, especially working from home and having children who are distance learning. Um, but communication is very key. Um, and you know, there, uh, there was a point where I have to take some leave um, and it was okay, you know, um, because I really had to um, prioritize what first and um, although I, you know, love being an APH, um, being a mom is really important. So for me, um, this has been an ongoing, you know, uh, task that I've been working towards, but also one thing I'm really passionate about is work wellness. And so that does help a lot may you know employee wellness I uh, attend classes and the information that I do there you know with uh, my co-workers I infuse in my family right so we practice meditation we do our walks we get our steps in so yeah um, I would say you know it's important but that communication piece is a uh, key to let other people know how are you doing what do you need um, you know and um, to kind of work to, to accomplish that. And Salem. Um, when it comes to consulting, I believe work-life balance has to be very uh, uh, purpose-driven. Otherwise, your time will be taken up by the work. Uh, one thing that I'm learning recently um, is that you can do a few things. One is protect your weekends. So a lot of times pushing back on weekday deliverables are not as easy, especially if the client wants something tomorrow morning and it was asked for today. So you can't really just walk away from that. And a lot of times what you could do is protect your weekends. And that's the biggest thing I've learned. Another one is um, knowing what your goals are out of your career. Because for example, my company, you could stay in the same role for five years, do normal 40 hour week, or you can work 60 to 70 hour weeks, um, but progress faster in your career. So if you know, like Harji said, what are your goals? If your goal is to have a very, very balanced life, you can do that. Um, or if you want to accelerate your, your trajectory, you could also do that. So just because um, you're working long hours does not mean it's against your will. So it's it's all in your control. And if you don't like it, find a new company, I think. If it doesn't, if they don't support your work-life balance. Thank you. Raz? Um, <laughs> just because it's what I do is a pilot study for COVID-19. It's just been kind of crazy. Um, I would say I didn't have much work-life balance for the past few months, um, managing a lot of data and consent forms. And um, it was it was just a lot. But um, like Salem said, like it wasn't by force, it was by choice. I really wanted to take the lead just to learn a, more about data management and gain that experience. And I'm glad I did. Um, but also I think working in public health, most people are mindful of um, just their own health. And so usually you end up in a workplace environment where everyone's like, okay, let's go take our daily walks or like, you know, like take a break, go take care of yourself. So that is a, that's a good, it's a good place to work um, being in public health. But um, I'd say now my work-life balance is Better. We're in like our next phase of our research. So things have calmed down a little bit and um, just COVID incidents has calmed down too. Thank you. How about you, Megan? I know that you've got your own additional work going on. And in, in addition to your job, you also have um, your clinic. Yeah, uh, it has taught me very much so how valuable boundaries are. And if you would if you would ask undergraduate me, I'd have an entirely different answer where I thought that the burnout was just like part of it. This is what we're doing. We're working and we're going to school and we're interning and it's, it doesn't present the best version of you when you aren't taking care of you. And so now fast forward, you know, to seven years into my career, I absolutely value my weekends. I'm not working on the weekends. Um, and 
when when my email is closed, it's closed for the night. And that can be very triggering for someone who has the need to respond and make sure that everyone is satisfied, but that takes practice. Um, and again, just mimicking like what has already been said that communicate your needs to those that you work for. If you have good leadership, they will understand because they've been in your shoes. Um, again, they're not scary. <laughs> so that and manage your time well. And that is a very, that's a, a constant practice. Um, and just remember you're not your output at the end of the day, you're not your job. And so having you time and your work separate is very valuable and important. I feel that uh, triggering thing <laughs> because yeah, I, I always want to answer everything immediately. Uh, okay, thank you, <laughs> um, Nicole. Yeah, so um, law school really exhausted me and I've realized that through the process, I don't want a job where it's, you know, billable hours um, and I want more of an eight to five job. And again, <laughs> you learn along the way. And so I've recognized that even judicial clerkships uh, are a great um, job opportunity because they're set hours of the court. You don't work on the weekends. You don't take your work home with you. While they're very competitive positions, I mean, I know I'm not going to be clerking for a Supreme Court justice, but um, I think I've recognized that there are jobs out there where you are able to stay sane. Uh, as a public health major, have to get my steps in. I like to be active, and so I need um, a job that allows me to be outside and take some time for myself and take care of my mental health. So there are even opportunities out there in the legal field where it's not going to be, um, you know, 15 hour days. Like I think the assumption is. That's definitely assumption I've heard um, frequently. So that's good to hear. Um, I know that uh, this question probably could go to any number of you. Um, feel free to jump in. There was a student who had asked, what do you do when you find an opportunity or an experience that you enjoy, but it isn't on the path that you have planned? Um, this student goes on to say, for example, they have been telling themselves that they want to go to medical school. After joining a lab and doing research, they realize that medical school might not actually be what they want. How do you sort of navigate that? I can start, I think. Um, I started out going to nursing school and I had no desire to do that. And I ended up in a research lab. And then again, seeking out those experiences, it's okay to say no to that. And that, that doesn't, it doesn't serve you and it doesn't fit you. I think um, following what Harji said about creating lists about what you do want and finding how that does fit into that role if it doesn't, that's okay. You, you might just have to let go of what might be a past, past goal. Anybody else? I know that we've had several of our panelists who talked about sort of changing their career path. Um, thank you, Megan, by the way. Um, but I know that several of our, our panelists have talked about changing their career path. And that's part of the reason why I thought that, that was such an interesting question. I, I could go. Um, I think it, it starts by asking yourself, how did that path come to fruition? if some of the experiences that you're undertaking now are leading you down a different thinking. And so perhaps the path is more of a thought as more so than based on your experiences and what you enjoy. So if you are going through life and going through your experiences and you're enjoying something new, that's completely fine. That is the whole point of these experiences. And no one's path is a straight line. And even people who want to become doctors won't have a straight line because what if they don't get their residency of choice or what if they don't get the internships of choice? Everybody has to switch paths at some point um, and so I wouldn't look at it as you're deviating from your path. I would look at it as your path is becoming more defined. And if you promise yourself, I want to become a doctor, this is my life dream. And you're realizing that there are certain things you might enjoy more. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. That's exactly what happened to me. And I think might happen to some of you. Thank you. Um, now, I know that uh, this, this is a student who is referring back to something that several of our panelists had talked about, which was trusting your gut. Um, this student is asking um, if you're when you're taking classes, um, do you trust your gut? I think that the answer to this is sometimes yes and sometimes no, but I'd love to hear our panelists take on this. Do you trust your gut when it comes to a class um, at the initial learning point when you start the class 
or once you're done with the class. For example, if you take an epidemiology class, you decide at the very beginning of the class whether that's something that you want to pursue, or do you decide after and you reflect on the class? Is this something that that you can find, um, you know, an answer based on your experiences? Um, it's on trusting your, what do you think is the best time to start thinking about those things? Um, I'll go ahead and answer. I don't think there's a clear and cut answer necessarily because I think it's an ongoing experience. Um, don't feel pressured right off the bat to be like, this is what I want to do. If it is, that's amazing. But it's okay, maybe halfway through and through the semester, through the quarter, check in, be like, how am I liking it? Is this something I want to do? Um, and then you can start kind of looking into the resources that are available um, that would be applicable. And even at the end, but if it's from the beginning, that's okay too. Um, so like you mentioned, Lisa, there's no yes or no answer. It really just depends. Um, that was our favorite answer during PT school. It always, it depends. So um, yeah, that was just my take on it. I would agree with you on that. That's what I kind of find um, with most of our students. Um, another student had a question, actually it looks like it was the same student had a question um, about um, looking back on one's school notes. Um, so for those of you, especially those of you who, who maybe just graduated the last couple of years, um, if you, it, do you ever look back on your notes from when you were an undergrad or in, in when you were in graduate school? And if you do look back on those notes, is there any way that you wished you would have prioritized them differently, um, organized them differently, made it so that um, you could find things um, more easily? I'll answer this just because I'm a moleskin snob. Like I'm really into notebooks and pens. And so I just remember even uh, Professor Leslie Lewis, I'm not sure if she still teaches there or not, but she was one of my favorite professors. I think she did urban studies. And I took a bunch of her, um, a bunch of her classes, but I know I kept her like notes in a specific book. And I actually wrote a paper on the diet of incarcerated pregnant women for one of my classes in law school. Um, cause I am really passionate about like prison issues as well. And so you get to like merge a bunch of issues in law school who would have known, but I did go back to those notes to, to refer to some of her lectures that I found pertinent. So I would just say, um, in terms of organization, I wasn't the best at organized notes. So I can't comment on that part, but I think just keeping everything, uh, in, yeah, she's still there, I guess, but keeping everything, uh, one class and one notebook worked for me. I have an on the spot example. On my desk is literally some of my master's program assign or um, articles that were printed and I need them. Literally, the, it's, the, that's the class name or the class number and they're all in here. So it depends on how useful the information is, which comes down to, is your degree going to be the degree you're using for, your, for whatever you're doing? My human biology notes will not help me here. But my master's program notes will help me here. So I think it depends, as Jessica said. Super helpful. Thank you both. Um, this question is for Salem and Hardy. Um, do you, Salem or Hardy, I suppose. Um, do you feel like your MHA program really helped you make your career clear? Take it, Hardy. <laughs> um. I'm going to say no. Um, I think it was a great uh, way for me to learn skills and explore a number of different areas. But um, I think my first year after I left grad school was the most enlightening, where I got to work on a number of different projects across operations, strategy, finance, tech, really explore them in person for an extended period of time. Um, and that's what helped me the most. Um, the program itself is great for the professors um, and the students because you know you're making those connections you're talking to each other about your career paths um, and these there's a bunch of professors that have lived it um, and are more than willing to help um, but i think the the real learning comes outside of the classroom thank you um, now we just have one additional question that has been uh that has been sent in in the Q&A. 
any students have any additional questions, we do have a couple more minutes. Um, we are gonna be ending at 6.30. So please go ahead and get those Q&A questions in. Um, this uh, question is again for Salem and Harji. Uh, what types of experiences do you think that would be the most helpful to get a career in healthcare consulting? Your turn. <laughs> um, healthcare consulting has many different uh, specializations. So it starts by identifying which part of healthcare consulting that you care about. So for my company, we'll be working with the providers, with the payers, with medical groups, whatever it may be. So um, if you're interested in the provider space, I would say get experience with a health system or a hospital system. So uh, Harji works at uh, CAC and, and, and CHLA, right? And I used to work at CAC and the USC health system was really a great grounds for learning. Um, so find a place where you could learn because consulting has to do with providing advice a lot of the times. It's not just doing the work, but it's also providing advice. So doing the work yourself first is uh, position, positions you better to provide advice to clients. Thank you. Um, I guess let's uh, wrap up. Um, if all of our panelists could think of your favorite and your least favorite things about your job, um, and then we'll wrap up, or your career, excuse me, um, and then we will wrap up with that. Um, maybe we'll start with Nicole, if you can think of your favorite and your least favorite things about law. Well, I guess after this whole hour and a half, I can't say I don't like it because <laughs> my paths, the twists and turns have led me here. But um, I do love the, the ability to work on a variety of issues. Again, I went to law school with a very binary restricted idea of what even a legal career can offer. And I learned that you can do so many things uh, with a legal degree. So that is one of the things that I most appreciate about this profession. Um, in terms of, I guess, least favorite, there is a lot of writing and there is um, way too much writing, but, and it's very bland writing. It's like the IRAC structure, it's issue rule analysis conclusion. So there is no prose, no flowery language. You get to the point, which is very different than even how I wrote with my UCSD classes, but it is what it is. People wanna know the issue and the answer. So those are my, that's my answer. <laughs> awesome, thank you, Megan. I'll start with my least favorite so I can end on a high note. My least favorite is sometimes that there's quite a bit of red tape when it comes to um, getting certain things to come to fruition in my work. So sometimes I wish there was a little bit less of that, um, but again, things take time. So but what I love most is the genuine connection that I feel like I ha have with the community that I serve. And I always leave my job at the end of the day feeling really good about what I do. And so I, you can't beat that. Thank you. Um, now, Aras? Um, my favorite thing is that I work in a team, a pretty big team, over 10 people. And I have learned over the past few years that I love that. I love working collaboratively with others. So um, that's what I enjoy most. Um, I don't really dislike anything about my current position, but I will say that um, in my last position as a coordinator is where I realized I don't like working alone and I, I worked alone on that project. So um, if you find that you really don't like something about your job and it's not a good fit, just find a new one. <laughs> Thank you. Salem. Um, start with the uh, not my favorite part and that is in creating presentations, a lot of times we have to just remove a lot of the slides and so we'd like, you'll have a presentation that you think is done and then someone will just like put an X across it. And this is just like a, a rest in peace to all these slides. So that's uh, one piece, but the more positive one is I think getting to work on very complex healthcare problems. Clients wouldn't come to us if the problems could have been solved without us. And so I think getting to think through them and getting to think of different ways to fix a problem or try to fix a problem, I think is, it makes me use my brain and I want that and, and I enjoy it. Thank you. Stephanie. 
Um, I like what Megan said, you know, start with the least and then end on a high note. Um, for me, the thing I least enjoy is when I have to work on a theoretical project. It reminds me of being in grad school. <laughs> And um, I really enjoy, you know, public relations. I enjoy uh, doing relationships with people in the community, community partners, those interpersonal opportunities. Um, you know, uh, for instance, at work, employee wellness is really something I enjoy because I get to interact with employees from other, um, you know, offices, units that I don't work with on a daily basis. This. Um, but I'm, you know, utilizing my health promotion and my personal skills. And so that's something I really enjoy. Thank you. And Jessica. Um, one thing I really love about my job is building um, patient report and working with the patient for weeks to months on end and seeing them constantly as well, once or twice a week versus, you know, sometimes if we go see our primary care doctor, we see them for 15 minutes every couple months, right? With our profession, they spend 30 full minutes with us once or twice a week. And that's when we start to get, you know, um, how should I say, like building more report, feeling, um, building good connections, I should say. And I love that about my job. Uh, patients are comfortable with us. Um, and the thing I don't like, unfortunately, we only have 30 minute sessions and I wish it could be an hour, uh, but because of the insurance system, we're only able to do 30 minutes. So that's just one thing I don't like is the whole insurance and dealing with that. And that's a whole nother thing that I don't wanna dwell on, but that's just the unfortunate thing about it. But yeah. Thank you. Um, and last but not least, Harchi. Um, okay, so we'll start with the negative. I thought that was a good idea. Um, so I think the pace of change um, in healthcare organizations can be tedious. You know, building strategy reports can take months. Implementing, rolling them out can also take months. Um, so that can be frustrating at times. But um, like Megan said, uh, you know, these things just take time. Um, on the positive side, um, you know, it feels like I'm working on the future of healthcare. Uh, you know. There's rising tech entrepreneurship um, in the industry. These huge companies like Google, Amazon, um, you know, Apple are getting into the space now. Um, and then, you know, on the CHLA role, uh, you know, I think especially in the wake of the pandemic, um, disparities have been exposed and exacerbated. Um, and it seems like there's a renewed focus on health equity. Um, and we're seeing a lot of roles popping up um, at the highest executive levels that are focusing on community health. Um, and I think that's really exciting um, that, you know, I get to work on both of these areas that are, you know, developing the future of the industry. Thank you all so much for your wonderful perspectives, for sharing so much about your careers and your lives. This has been such exciting uh, panel. Um, and I think that uh, all of us have really learned so much. So I want to again, thank our panelists, remind our, our attendees um, that this panel will be available on the public health um, YouTube channel and on our website sometime soon, this week probably, um, as will our panelist um, the bios and their contact information. So if you do have additional questions for our panelists, please look for that on our website um, very soon, later this week, and uh, feel free to reach out to them. Most of our panelists um, have LinkedIn or they have other ways of reaching out listed on those panelists' bios. So again, giant thank you. I hope everyone has a wonderful night. Bye.